I can give the quotation just in there. I can't remember the name of the chap. The Manchester Guardian. Shh. Good evening and welcome once again to Plain Talk. Tonight my guest is Mr. Robert Lalji, a Guyanese who has been living in the United Kingdom for several, several years. He is a writer, he's also a publisher. But tonight he will be speaking to us about the life and the contribution of one of the Caribbean's greatest economists, Sir Arthur Lewis. As you know, Sir Arthur is one, is the first of three West Indians to have won the Nobel Prize. In Sir Arthur's case, it was for economics. The other Sir Arthur was St. Lucian, the other St. Lucian to have won the Nobel Prize was Derek Walcott. Mr. Derek Walcott, poet and writer. And of course, the third person from the Caribbean is Sir Vidya Naipaul who is regarded as one of the better writers in the English language. Mr. Lalji, welcome to Plano. Mr. Ram, thank you very much. Sure. It's All a right. pleasure to be here. Um, Robert, now, please. You are a Guyanese. You left Guyana how long ago? Well, I first left Guyana when I was nine. That's a very long time ago. Yeah. That's in 1962. But the most, on the most recent occasion? Um, about 25 years. Over 25 years I've, I've been away. So that would put you sometime in the late 80s. Is that right? Late 80s, early 90s. Yeah, about that, yeah. Um, maybe what, one of the good benchmarks we have in Guyana, you know, to place things is, oh, this person was the president or Hoyt. that person was the president. <laughs> president Hoyt was, was, was president when I was here. So if President Hoyt, then it would have meant it sometime after 1985 and sometime before 1992. Yeah, when President Burnham died and Hoyt took over, I was doing postgrad in England. Yeah. So I came back after, just after. So I came back during Hoyt's time. Um, and I left during his time as well. Um, and then I moved to Barbados because I, I, I was doing, um, in, in 88, which was during Hoyt's time, um, I launched what was the first whale exclusive in the history of Caribbean broadcasting, mm -hmm. which was a program called CLR James, His Life Achievements and Thoughts. No, that was launched in August, um, which was Emancipation Month as a part mm -hmm. of the national celebrations in Guyana. But um, we were having so many blackouts that I was getting the, 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 <laughs> the tri transcripts of the program typed up. And the poor young lady who was typing it was working with a mechanical typewriter by lamplight. Uh, you've been back since when, on, on this particular visit? Since July the 1st, I flew. Have you been experiencing any blackouts? Uh, not many. A few, yes. Most certainly. And, you know, the thing uh, is... When it, tell me, you left Ghana 
the life in Ghana, lots of blackouts, um, despite the fact that it was during the economic recovery period. Yeah. Um, you come back to blackouts. How very do you feel? little, very little, very little. Very little blackout since I've been here. Now, what have you been doing in England? Having a ball. <laughs> <laughs> no, what happened, my mother was living in England, right? And my parents divorced when I was young. So I grew up with my mother and I grew up in England. And um, she was aged, so I, I was in the Caribbean because I was researching. Before I did the Arthur Lewis book, I did a radio program on him because I'm a broadcaster first and foremost. Mm -hmm. So after I did a James life story, um, James meaning C. L. R. James. James, yeah, and and C. L. R. James has been called um, one of the greatest minds that ever lived. And by the way, if I may make a point, um, there are four Nobel Prize winners in the West Indies. Who's the fourth? He was the first. C. L. R. James was a no, Nobel. No, no, not James. There was another writer. Okay. Anyway, right? go on. Um, St. Ledger, St. Ledger, St. John Purse. I think his, his real name was René Moran, St. Ledger, St. Ledger, but St. John Purse. But you see, he was from Martinique. You see, and Martinique is... is, is Department of France. Overseas Department of France. Yeah, okay. But if he'd done something bad, they would have said he's Martinican yeah. and West Indian. But because he did something good... So you were in England and you were doing... Postgrad and research and writing and so on. Um, but you were also in in... Production? Film production? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I've done a lot of film production. I, you know, um, I've been doing films, documentaries, um, shooting for television for over 25 years now, probably 30 years. But I have my own production company um, and I enjoy it thoroughly. What, what, what kinds of production? What, what, what genre? What, what type? Anything to do with culture, biographies specifically, West Indian, African, Indian. Um, I, I like to do what's not been done before, right? Like in, in the UK, I'm a resource person for the British government, specifically in the Second World War, right? So I've made films of lectures that I've given, like in, in, in 2000 and... 2005, this is a decade ago, Chris. This is a, oh, gosh. <laughs> Seems like 10 days ago. They, they celebrated the 60th anniversary of the end of World War II. Yeah. So I was invited. It was the first time they invited me, actually. I was invited to give a lecture on the West Indian contribution to Britain during World War II. No, I couldn't refuse an offer like that because I knew... If I didn't do it, the West Indian story would not be told. And this was part of the national celebrations in the UK. So I filmed that. And um, the next year, they asked me to repeat it, and I refused. You know, I said, well, well suppose some of the same people come. <laughs> they could say, I only know one thing to talk about. You know, it's like a musician only playing one tune all the time on the piano. <laughs> so I said, no, and it wasn't a challenge. I want a challenge. I want to get my teeth into something. If you were to, uh, if you were to pick a country from the Caribbean, and let's talk about the British Caribbean, we would have been all colonies yeah. at that stage. Which West Indian colony, British West Indian colony, made the greatest contribution to the British effort, to the Allied effort? in terms of number of persons that we volunteered, <laughs> who would that be? Which country would that be? That would be Jamaica by weight of population. But if you do it by, by the ratio of the volunteers to the population of the country, then it changes totally. And, and it would be what? Well, for me, it would have to be Bermuda. And few people know that. But you see, what happened in Bermuda, right, and also Martinique, what happened in Bermuda that is not known, that the British Secret Service, British intelligence, right, were operating illegally in America because American law states no foreign agents can operate in American territory. 
So Churchill sent one of his closest and most trusted friends, who was the head, they call him the quiet Canadian, Bill Williamson. They sent him to America, and Bishop German had spies there too, mind you. So he was sent to America, and he told he had a meeting with Hoover, who was the, 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 the head of the FBI. Yeah, yeah, yes. And he told Hoover, we will be operating, our agents will be operating on American soil. What do you need? What do I have to do to make you turn a blind eye to the, our operations? Because he knew Hoover would find out. Yeah. Directed the FBI, come on, he must know. So Hoover told him, the president will have to tell me so. And then I'll turn a blind eye. Well, Hoover got the shock of his life because Williamson said to him, Bill said to him, the president will tell you so tomorrow. And the president did. So, of course, Hoover never liked Williamson because he wanted to know how come this man comes from England and he has over his head, yeah. direct access to the president to tell him what the president's going to do before the president knows it. Or before right? he knew it, yeah. So, what happened, just in case Hoover and it broke out in American news, it had to be kept very, very quiet, right? Bermuda was a transshipment point. Planes stopped over. All planes flying from America to Europe stopped over in Bermuda. So there was a hotel there, and in case they got kicked out of America, the backup plan was Bermuda. And because all the country's planes were stopping there, Williamson had in one hotel alone over 2,000 intelligent operatives in the basement, and they opened all diplomatic bags, all, all, all. Because of this, um, Vichy, France, mm -hmm. that collaborated with Germany, the leader, his daughter, right, who had diplomatic immunity, her letter was searched as well. And they could open thousands of letters in an hour. It had to be done very, very quickly because the planes refueled, you see, in Bermuda. And, um, Just on shipment. Yeah. And what they found out from them is that one of Hitler's most evil geniuses was so well placed with his spies in America that there was only one thing they could do to stop him now, and that was to assassinate him. Reinhard Heydrich. They found that letter with her. Reinhard Heydrich was such a cunning man that he, I wouldn't say invented, he concocted letters from the German high command to the Russian high command generals before Russia was involved in World War II. And then he made sure Stalin later found out with his letters. So when Stalin found out and he thought all his top generals were collaborating with the German top generals, he executed all of them. So when the Soviet Union entered the war, the Russian army was emasculated of leadership, right? Now, what happened with this letter from Bermuda? But of course, the, the Russian army did very well. Later, in, but that's in why in the start of the war, they were totally emasculated. It was because of the cunning and the planning of Reinhard Heydrich. Heydrich but had superseded everyone in Germany, and he was now practically Hitler's deputy. But, but we're going back to... Um, Coming to back the to the West Indies. Yes, and the West Indian contribution to the war. No, I say... Well, that was all part of it, because without no, that but letter... The, but other parts of it. Uh, without tell me that about letter... The, tell me about the contribution of the other countries. Well, I said Martinique, so that's one. Why I say Martinique, what happened? France had transported all the gold reserves from the f you know their central bank and hidden it in martinique churchill found out this is where martinique made a great contribution so what it was secret of course so what churchill did he cordoned off martinique with submarines and ships mm -hmm. and then he got actuaries and accountants like yourself financial wizards to show America that because 
they could they had total access to this money and, and it was um France who was overrun. They used it as a letter of credit with the American government for armament. Let me as as a matter of fact, there's one more thing. You you know the f the film Goldfinger? Yeah. That was Who based doesn't? that was based on the Martinique French central bank reserves there and what they did during the Second I, World I, War. I want to tap into your knowledge about um, the Arthur West Lewis. Indian contribution. No, we'll get we'll get to Arthur Lewis. Um, yeah. Because. Well, I'm still well, on they, that. They would, they would be part of that first wave of migrants to the UK. No, they weren't migrants. They were volunteers. No, they went yeah, up. but but in after they, the they war, didn't migrate. A lot of them came back home. Actually, a lot of them came back home. Right, um, as we were in Guyana, Cy Grant was captured during the war. Mm -hmm. The famous actor, yeah, singer, yeah. Guyanese, Cy Grant. He, he died about a year and a half ago. He was a veteran of the RAF. Um, you have another one who Ted was Ted Braffitt, is it? He Edward, was in yeah, Ed. Uh, Ed yes. Braffitt, he, he's still alive. And he he's was in the RAF as well. He was in, in the in RAF. Fact, in fact, you mention him in your book, don't you? Yes, yes, he's mentioned in there. As one of the, um, he was one of the colleagues of that. Well, he was there at that period when they were there because Arthur Lewis was there too. But Arthur Lewis was was um, called Constantine was there, Lord Leary Constantine. Yeah. Um, that would be you mentioned Sir Leary Constantine. Lord you, Leary Constantine, yeah, he, he was Lord, later right. Baroness. Yeah, yeah. Baron, um, not Baroness. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse yeah, me, Leary, wherever yeah, you are. <laughs> Um, CLR James. Yes, he went up in thirty. As a matter of fact, James went up because of Constantine. He went up to publish his first book. And there were some other people around that same era, that Eric Williams, um, the Manleys came up, you know, before after Lady Lewis was there. Arthur Lewis was yeah. there. Um, a tremendous amount of West Indians, and because there was such a small grouping of West Indians, um, Raz Mackinnon which was a name he took as a gentleman from Buxton who was one of the greatest figures in the history of the Pan-African movement in the world. As a matter of fact, he practically financed the fifth Pan-African conference in Manchester in 1945. He was there. They were all there. So let's, get, let's get now to Sir Arthur Lewis. Here yeah. is a youngster. Um, child of a single parent. Well, he's brought hold, up by hold, a single hold, parent. Hold, hold, hold on. He, how did he make it to that, to that level where he has he has become a legend? What happened? And sometimes we don't respect the importance of teachers in our society, and I think our Minister of Education is now saying that. I think Earl John has said that when he looked at the comparisons of, of, of rewards and teachers are some of the worst rewarded in this society, in West Indian society, and the least respected, upset by the children and some of the parents, but then they forget. Well, I'll tell you, um, the police and the nurses may say the same thing. Well, I will agree with that. Well. I will agree with that too. But, but your, your I will point agree is with that. So, Arthur, and I speak as a teacher myself. I, I teach in my programs. I lecture at universities. I've lectured at universities in England. Yeah, but we're talking about that. Um, but we, I'm coming back to that, yeah. Chris, if you give me a moment. So now, what happened? Lewis's parents were teachers, were graduate teachers, right? One day he fell sick for three months. His parents were worried. Three months of school, so his father taught him at home for the three months. When he went back to school, <laughs> he jumped three years. <laughs> his father taught as much in three months as the school taught in three years, which uh, gave him a hell of a problem. Because he remained the youngest in whichever class he went? Not only that, think of that age when you're young, seven, eight. Skinny. That, and you're skinny, you're puny, so he was a puniest. And now if he is a puniest, and he's brighter than all the other guys. What are they going to do to him? Yeah. And what did they do? Well, of course, they bullied him a bit. He was physically very inferior to them. 
Um, and it gave him a terrible sense of inferiority, which, which remained for him, you know, with him for the rest of his life. He became one of the world's leading economist. Yeah, you said um, one of the Caribbean's greatest. Y- yes, at that stage, yes, Caribbean. I, I'm now taking it beyond that. Oh, because you. he became he became a development specialist. Yeah. He was now, the foremost in the world. But economics was not his first choice as a subject. His first degree was not in economics, you're quite right. You know he But he, he didn't want to, to do, he didn't even want to study he wanted, wanted to do engineering. engineering Is that right? But he knew no white company, no firm obviously white firm, would employ a black engineer. So he went to do management, right, at the LSE. Now, when he won the scholarship, what happened? Lewis finished his secondary education at the age of 14. So he, he was too young. Go. <laughs> he, he couldn't go. He had to be 18, right? So they gave him a small clerical job in the Ministry of Ag- Agriculture, which he learned a lot, to write, to type, and so on, and to be orderly. When he was 18, he sat, this, sat the exam, won the scholarship, went to the LSE. He did a four-year degree program. London School of Economics. London yeah. School of Economics, world yeah. famous. He graduated with the highest marks in the history of the London School of Economics. And Chris, what was absolutely sensational in British university history, at the age of 22, he was given a lecture in contract at the LSE. It was a sensation in British academic history. This young black man, though, at the age of 22, is lecturing to Yeah. <laughs> and he was also given of course, a scholarship of course, to do his Of course, the PhD. LSE was one of the most progressive tertiary institutions in the United Kingdom. Yes. Um, and I think... All, all, the, all the great third world politicians, or lots of them, had their schooling. LSE and SOAS. Yes, yes. Yeah. But, but there are other brilliant universities too. Oxford, Cambridge, um, um but in terms, of, in, in terms of revolutionary um, and, and, and well, Rodney new was thinking. At SOAS. Uh, Rodney was at SOAS. I think you get it all universities, Clive but LSE, LSE produces that. It does have a name for yeah, that. Yeah. But I have a cousin who's recently gone to LSE. She went there to do a master's, a second master's in international trade. And the students complained of the quality of the teaching in the course. So that's what's happened. And she paid about 38000 per year, either US dollars or pounds, because she was a US student. She's a Guyanese girl. She's right here in Guyana right now, actually. So we were talking about, about Sir Arthur. Yeah. 22. He, yeah. Um, he hadn't got his doctorate as yet. He got it Two at, years at later, 25, yeah. I think he got um, it A couple of years later, yeah. Yes, three years later. A couple of years later, he got his PhD in development economics, right? Industrial development economics. Why did he turn to development economics? They often Why did he it turn? It wasn't known. It wasn't very much known at the time. So they needed, they needed people to research this field because if you think when the Industrial Revolution took place, right, it was too early for them to analyze it as it was happening as such. So when Lewis did it, you know, they needed to have formal study in this kind of thing. You know, because the Industrial Revolution, which began in England, changed the world. Really? So we're talking about sometime in what? In about the forties? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're talking about that. He went up he went up as an eighteen year old. He's, he's born in twenty in, in, in twenty fifteen. Fifteen. So he went up at eighteen. Right? Thirty three, yeah. Yeah. Um so that's when we're talking about, yeah. I interrupted you r- rudely. Um, Not at all. About, I won't about, accept that. You, about, about the, I don't the think teaching. you can be rude. Come on. His, his, his father died when he was very young. Seven years old, shortly after teaching him. So yeah. his mother had it. But, you know, John Horne. And we've got to say a lot of tribute to John Horne. John Horne is a former Minister of Education in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And if it wasn't for John, Chris and I wouldn't be sitting here to at least not discussing Sir Arthur Lewis. Because John was a Minister of Education. He was also acting Deputy Prime Minister and he acted as Prime Minister. And we met in the squash court. Hold on. You've got you Guyanese, you've got um, John Horn. John Horn. Vincentian. Vinci. Vinci. And Sir Arthur said Lucian. Lucian, yeah. <laughs> so you met all met up? No, no, no. What happened? I was playing squash. I, I just finished doing the radio program 
Because after my CLR, James Ray Dupree. Really in, in the UK. No, in um in St. Vincent, because I was I, I was finishing okay, good. Sir Arthur Lewis radio program, which took about five years. Like the James program, it's called Sir Arthur Lewis, His Life, Achievements and Thoughts. Now, John had heard that I'd done this program. So, of course, one day coming off the squash court, he came up with this hideous suggestion. You know, I had my back to him, Chris, and he says, Robert, you know, very courteous, well spoken man, why don't you write a book on Arthur Lewis? for young students. I was appalled. I was aghast, Chris. I spent five years in the radio program. I fought serious battles to get that done. Now I was relaxing. I wanted to go and do a PhD, you know, and he's telling me, write a book for young students. Man, Chris, I wanted to wring his long neck. But you did. I'm wiser than that. He, one, he's younger than me. Two, he's six foot eight. Three, he's stronger than me. It would have been very ill-advised that I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit wiser than that. So I turned and asked, you know, graciously said, John, um, I'm really not interested in writing for young children in the Caribbean. I think it's more urgent that the adult community in society get to know Sir Arthur's work. That's why I've done it in a radio program and so on. And he understood, and then he, tried, he said again, but why don't you try and write a book from your radio program on Arthur Lewis? And I said, but John, the style of writing for radio and the style of writing for book are completely different. And then the style of writing for young students and young adults, again, is different <laughs> from writing for adults. So, you know, I would have to... But he kept persisting and every time we met in a squash court. He would persist afterwards in the bar. And in the end, I said, John, look, OK, I'll tell you what I do, because he got me in a guilt trip now, because I always complained that at the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, I used to complain I used to complain the most that we don't do enough in Guyana <coughs> to honour our heroes. So now John they had me. John had me now in a guilt trip. I said, "Well, I'm always complaining about this." So my solution was to do the program in CLR James, who I think the greatest Caribbean man alive. Arthur Lewis was a great one too, and I thought, "Well, that's what I've been complaining about." So I said, "John, want I said, Look, I'll tell you what. I'll agree to do the program if you agree to write the introduction." Because I was pulled him in the same boat with me, and he says, "Robert, it's a deal." <coughs> and, and and both of you kept kept your promise. Yeah, three years later, I feel, why I didn't want to do it as well, Chris. No one funds these things in the Caribbean. I mean, yeah, it's been recommended to all the realists, but who funds it? No government will say they fund it. The Caribbean Development Bank are not were not developing enough to fund it. The Eastern Caribbean Central Bank and Dwight Venner. They're afloat in the sea like a ship without a, a rudder. You know, um, it's, 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 it means I had to fund it too. I had to fund the research. I had to fund the writing. And to do the research, I had to go back and visit Caribbean countries. I just left research in the radio program because they're two totally different things. So with the, with the encouragement of his tutor, his professor, Young Sir Arthur chose development economics. Yeah, they offered him that, yeah. It was a very new topic at the time. Now, he, he chose this area that was so important to him. Why was, why was poverty such an important ah, issue ah, to that, Sir Arthur? That because is a that superb was really was a, question. Well, let's, that get, is let's get the answer. Few people, few people. I don't think anyone else, Chris, congrats, I don't think anyone else has asked me that question. <laughs> Go on, answer it. <laughs> no. Two things. Think of a single mother today bringing up five little children. Think of it in Sir Arthur's day in the 1920s, what it must have been like. She had to have a sweet shop. He said his mother was the most hard-working person he'd ever met in her life. And I mean... I'm not, not being rude here, Chris, right? But I don't think there are many men would look at a, a widow with five boys and say, she's an attractive widow, I like her, <laughs> I will date her and look to marry her. I think they will flee when they see those five boys. So that was one thing. The other thing, St. Lucia was so backward, and a lot of other Caribbean countries, not just St. Lucia, 
But after we saw women carrying coal on their heads in big basket, working like beasts in the and, hot and sun. The, and the banana plantation and the, and the cocoa the, the, the plantation. The sheer poverty. Of, and he was always concerned about that. And Chris, he used was to plantation ask people, life. yes, he used to ask friends when he was an undergraduate, write and tell him about what's going on in St. Lucia, what's happening with it, what's happening with the poverty and whatnot and so on. So that was what spurred him on. And he said the best thing that they ever been said he said money is not the cure for poverty but education I, I think the book says yes the cure for poverty is not money but knowledge it's, it's knowledge education yeah. Yeah. education dr richard also oh um, wonderful person yeah oh, you, you magnificent man you mentioned he wrote about sir arthur for he was driven by a compassion for the poor and underdeveloped peoples of the world. Yes, Alsop's speech, panegyric, which I didn't know what it meant at the time. It was eulogy <laughs> for Sir Arthur. Oh, what, what, pana who? Pana what? <laughs> it, it, it's <laughs> but also, it? for, 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 for those of our viewers who may not be familiar with Alsop, Dr. Richard Alsop was a former headmaster at QC, he is also the editor of the um, the, uh, the the Caribbean, the Caribbean dic the Dictionary of Caribbean English Usage, yes. mm -hmm. right? Dictionary of Caribbean English Usage, and he has been a consultant editor before he died. He died a few years ago. He was a consultant editor for over twenty-five years to the Oxford English Dictionary which I think the proper one is about 20 volumes. He was a consultant editor, so he's one of the greatest minds that this region has ever produced. And when he did that, I didn't know he did this tribute, this panegyric to Sir Arthur, but during my research at UE, um, one of the senior librarians, um, Jennifer, brought it to my attention and said, had I seen it? And I said, no, and she went and got it to me. And the minute I read it, I said, I gotta have that in my book. I just gotta have that in my radio program at the time. So um, Richard Alsop was about six foot four, strapping man, and he'd march like a soldier, you know. And I knew where he went walking and at the, near the university, because I live near there in Barbados. So I went and introduced myself a day to him. And I said, um, excuse me, Richard, um, Dr. Alsop. I said, um, you don't know me, but my name is Robert Lalji, and I'm writing Sir Arthur Lewis's life story for radio. And I've come across your panegyric. And um, I'd like to use it in my radio program. But the thing is, it wasn't recorded by the radio television programs here. Um, will you be kind enough to do it for me again? And he says, oh, yes, 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 Robert. I will definitely do that for Sir Arthur Lewis. I said, no, you won't, Richard. You're doing it for Robert Lalji, not Arthur Lewis. Get this right now. And he looked at me as if I'd suddenly grown another head. He says, all right, all right, Robert, I'll do it for you. And he did. He was magnificent. Now, you, another name you mention in the book, and he is perhaps one of the greatest left-wing economists of the past century, Harold Lasky. Oh, yes. What... What would you say was the now, impact of Lasky? Tremendous, tremendous, on and Lewis, tremendous, tremendous, tremendous. Not only gu guided him, but he supported him at all times at the appointment committee, whenever Arthur applied for appointments. Because in academia, sometimes they don't like to appoint you. As happened with Richard Alsop. Richard Alsop was promised his professorship the minute he finished the Dictionary of Caribbean English Usage. It never materialized. The vice chancellor of the university at the time lied to Richard Alsop. Richard was very hurt about that. We have that in academe all over the world. But Lasky supported Lewis at every step. Uh, I think he was the one who told him as well to teach um, a program on what happened between the war years. And Lewis said, but, but I don't know what happened during the war years. And he said, don't you know the best way to learn a subject is to teach it? <laughs> <laughs> so he did. 
lots of times Sir Arthur came up to that wall a black man cannot go beyond this point whether it was for his job when he applied for the job yeah when he applied for scholarships he, he had no he, he never had, had a problem with scholarships it was a job because he he applied for the job as professor at, at Liverpool University yes no. <coughs> and Liverpool rejected him you see, in those positions in England, you would have to deal with the, the people in the city, as they call it, the bowler hat and the umbrella ones who do. Let me just correct. Let London. me just correct you respectfully. Yeah. Um, in fact, he he faced racial barriers in Trinidad. On page twenty-four, as you. Oh, know, you mean when he applied he when he got his first degree? Yeah, yeah, when he applied for the job. I thought you were talking about England. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so um, he grew. He grew up. Here he was with first-class honors. Right from the LSE, and he, he applied for a job as an accountant with the mayor and city council in mayor and city council for Port of Spain, and he was refused it, and it went to a clerk who happened to be related, a cousin of the mayor. <laughs> so he didn't get the job, but he got the scholarship from the LSE. So yeah, you, you're quite right there. You've done a good bit of research, Chris. Not really. Now, honest. we're talking, we're talking about someone several decades after he had won the Nobel Prize. 79, 1979, yeah. yeah. He was the first black man to win the Nobel Prize for an intellectual discipline yeah. in the world. Because you had Ralph Bunch who won it for peace, you had Chief Albert Latouli who won it for peace, and you had Martin Luther King who won it for peace. Yeah, you had Rabindra Tagore had also, that was for literature, was it? Literature, yeah. but I said black man. Yeah, yeah. Indian people I don't, listen don't class themselves. I you don't. do not, but they're Indian people out there and in our views, if you tell them they're black, it, yeah. they, it's, it's a Anyone deep offense and insult to them. So Robert, Robert, as you know, if you live in England, they should go in England and live because yeah. Indian people, Guyanese, have told me that when the Teddy Boys was coming to beat up the Black Boys, the Indian guys would say to them, "Hey, are you run? Are you run? Are you Black guys? Are you run? Are you run? Quit!" Them Teddy Boys coming for beat you up, and when the Teddy Boys came, the Black West Indians are gone. The Indians were there, and they beat hell out the Indian guys. Well, then they knew they were black. Let me ask you this, um, because this is what I used to do. Does this still happen? I lived in Clapham North. Okay. Yeah. Um, or I lived in Sockwell, but the, the tube soap was clapping yeah. on. When so, you, South London, yeah, not yeah. far from Brixton. Yeah. So when you work late in the nights, um, you do some school keeping or some kind of work to raise the money, <laughs> you wait at that tube station until you see some Jamaican brother or something like that, and you say, okay, I can call you. Know you know you're safe. I know you're safe. You know you're safe. Does that still happen now? Yes, yes. Um, I mean, there's racism in England right now. Stephen Lawrence was murdered 20 years ago, yeah. I think 25 years ago. There's racism in the police force. They're trying to get rid of it. Um, Sir so, so Bernard Hogan Ho, the um, commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, has zero tolerance of racism. He's a man I have tremendous confidence in. He will do a lot of good work with the Metropolitan Police. But the rest of the society, you see, what came out of the Stephen Lawrence inquiry was the Metropolitan Police Force was institutionally racist mm -hmm. and it's not the police force it's the whole of society white people in position in England a lot of them think they know everything they don't even understand what racism is you know they, they, they don't want to play black people who are consultants who can tell them so they, they keep on making mistakes they will keep on making mistakes you mentioned just now the cure for poverty is not money but knowledge. Knowledge, it's, education. It's give people a job, create employment. Gov governments educate them so they can get the job, job and function properly in the job, and bring something add to the job, help the job to and develop the whole society. Lewis himself, and I don't say this with any disrespect to the Nobel laureate, Sir, Sir Arthur himself. Um, 
attribute he he never took credit for his great gifts he, never. he, he, he um he, he never thought, look, this was because of his scholarship. No. Come back to his, what you said earlier about how he, how he did it as a child. His mother, and this is the importance of mothers in our society, right? His mother apparently used to tell all the boys, there's always room at the top. You must work hard. Do whatever you do to the best of your, your ability because there is always room at the top. All those boys were successful. One was Sir Alan Lewis. He was Chancellor of the University of the West. He was Chancellor of the University of Ghana, actually, and so was Sir Arthur. Sir Arthur was Chancellor of our university here, too. Um, and, and Sir Alan, his brother, was later Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, which is a remarkable thing for s persons brought up by a single parent, a mother. Um, another one was a lawyer. Um, another one was a physician. And another one was a successful businessman in Africa. So not one of them, two of them were knighted. Um, his mother did a magnificent job on those boys. She, she obviously did. <laughs> um, we talked about the people that, that, that Sir Arthur, his, his pool of friends, um, each of them great in their own right. I mean, you, you had Eric Williams. Oh, Captain very special friend of his. W Capitalism to slavery. Yes. C.L.R. James, do you know, and a lot of people don't know, because William and James found out, and I fell out, and I think it, they took it out of capital and slavery later on. But, J but, but Williams, when he took first class honors, right, wasn't sure what to study. James had taught Williams in school at Queen's Royal College. So Williams used to go and spend vacations with him. When James wrote The Black Jacobins, he took Williams to France with him to help him with his research and so on. And it was James who scribbled the thing when he asked him what to do for his PhD. And James said, take this to your professors. And when he took it him, the outcome of it was capitalism and slavery. In the early copies, they have tribute to James, but I think Williams took it out S later when they fell out. Still one of the greatest books, Capitalism and Slavery. Oof. It ranks... Not just in West Indian history, but world history and on the subject. Um, I think the first of, of them all... Um, has to be the Black Jacobins by C.L.R. James, which is the examination of slavery. And why I say that, that was published in 1938 and was called a classic. Immediately upon publication, right? Um, so that, you can say, was the first great study of slavery, academic study of slavery was by James. So you can see the influence now on, on, on Williams. And then Williams's book was another landmark book. Which, the same book you wrote, Capitalism, Capitalism and, slavery. and Slavery. Yes, Because yes. he wrote from Columbus to Castro. Yes, yes. That, which that is was another masterpiece. Oh. Oh, oh, he was a brilliant guy. Lovely guy. As a matter of fact, they were very personal friends, you know. Lady Lewis told me that whenever they were in Trinidad, <laughs> Eric would come and pick up Arthur, and they're gone all day. She don't know where they're gone. She don't know what they did. She don't know who they met. <laughs> you know, they just got out. Williams would carry them. Probably discussed they. economics. And um, I had a few <laughs> uh, rum and oh. something, coconut water and something. Um, but yeah, Will Williams was one of the greatest minds the Caribbean's ever produced. Most definitely Eric Williams as well. But James and Lewis were beyond Williams. Not that I'm, I'm, I'm being disparaging in any way. You did mention two Guyanese as well. And one might say very contrasting Guyanese. Forbes Burnham and Walter Rodney in your book. Yeah, definitely. Um, you got to remember Burnham was about England that time. And when Guyana became independent, now. Chedi Jagan, correct me if I'm wrong here, founded the University of Guyana in 1963. That's correct. And it was founded at, it, it, it was lodged at Queen's College. That's correct. Now, in 1966, after a turbulent time of racial disturbances in Guyana, Guyana became independent in 1966. That's right, yeah. Right? Now, Burnham was the father of the nation of independence who led Guyana to independence. Now look at what Burnham has done here. 
In 1967, Sir Arthur Lewis is installed as Chancellor of the University of Guyana. A remarkable thing to happen within one year of independence. Now, I'm, I'm not saying Chetty had no credit for that because Chetty loved the teachings of Sir Arthur and Chetty, Chetty used to speak about using them here in Guyana. But I think when Chetty came to power, he was a little old. Um, I know a lot of people say it, it would have been great if Chetty had got to power earlier. And the problem with Guyana is they produce two powerful leaders at the same time. In fact, you use a strong language in discussing Chedi's really? removal from power. Oh, what did I say? Um, after the Americans kicked him out or something like that? Well, yes. Uh, now, hold on. Let's get what something straight. Everybody says, or used to say long ago, Burnham rigged the election. Now, what happened? is the Bay of Pigs took place. Kennedy, coming up for election, could not afford another communist country coming to power. Clem Cicheran, one of the most brilliant, Clem has won the, the El Segovia Prize, the most prestigious prize in the world for history. Clem Cicheran has won it. Read his book, Jock Cap, Sweetening Bitter Sugar, Jock Camel and Bitter, and you will see it. Chedi lost power because he was told not to mention socialism, not to mention communism, but he went straight in the White House and he did it. And he pointed in President Kennedy's finger and President Kennedy was looking at him the way a mongoose looks at a snake when Chetty was pointing his finger in his face in the White House. Clem gave me that picture. Now, what happened is Kennedy approached Macmillan, yeah, um, who was Prime Minister of England. Let me give the exact quote from the Please do, book. please do. The former British Guyana then gained its independence on 26 of May 1966, becoming Guyana. Now the Chetty Jagan was forcibly removed from power. I just wanted to correct the. Yes, uh, yes. And, and can you read the part where it says about Harold Macmillan? Kennedy spoke to Macmillan and asked him to delay Guyana's independence on the Chetty because he couldn't afford another communist country. And it was, it was Kennedy who engineered whatever took place in Guyana. So let's get that right too. Kennedy is not a knight in shining armor completely. We all have our flaws. What, how did Walter Rodney make it into this book on Sir Arthur Lewis? Well, when they, when they, when Arthur Lewis resigned, <laughs> Rodney led protests. You know, Rodney was always leading protests somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> now, i got to say something about Walter that you may not know, is that when Walter went to the SOAS, School of Oriental and African Studies, world famous, they said when Rodney went there and passed out, he had blown away all the intellectual cobwebs in SOAS. He was that revolutionary, I think. Uh, so Rodney was an undergraduate, you see, at the time. Rodney was at UE when um, Sir Arthur what resigned. Time? As Chancellor? As, as Vice Chancellor, he resigned. And you know what you said about poverty and Arthur Lewis saying knowledge, education is. This is why he took the university. He met 690 pupils. I mean, in three years, he took it to over 2,000. Not only did he take it to over 2,000, the School of Tropical Agriculture is world famous, the most famous school in the world. It was in Trinidad. It's what became the University of West Indies, St. Augustine campus. Lewis got the fund for that, and he also got the fund for the Cave Hill campus. All within three years, that's what he was knighted for. They said he made an epochal change in the provision of education in the West Indies in a single generation. He did it in three years. A remarkable achievement. You said you've been here a few since July. That's, first that's of July I arrived here. I'm gonna, Not the first of April, I have you know. <laughs> I, I'm going to ask you about um, the, the University of Guyana where Sir Arthur had in fact acted as Chancellor for a while. But and Sir Alan, his brother, yeah. What do you think? If you were to ask, I, I suspect, you know, of, of the, the if you were to Guyana. ask even some economic students, at the University of Guyana, they may not know a lot. 
of this gentleman, Sir Arthur Lewis? Um, I don't think so, because you got Clive Thomas there, or you had Clive Thomas I, there. I had, yes. Right? But I'll tell you what happened. At the same university, Cave Hill, St. Augustine, particularly Cave Hill, where Sir Arthur Lewis got the funds to build that university, right? where lecturers could go and get jobs and students can go and learn. They refused to teach his theories. They drove him out the West Indies. They would have killed him with their callous treatment and their indifference and their conniving and their nasty West Indians crab in a barrel ways. We have them all. I share them too. I'm not exonerating myself. Don't get me wrong. I say I'm in that too. Unless we can get over that you as know, West you Indians. You know, we talk, we talk about crab in a barrel, but... It, it, Soberly, when you think of those persons who helped each other, starting with Sir Larry Constantine, C.L.R. James, S Sir Arthur Lewis, um, Errol Barrow, Forbes, they, they, they were supported each other. Oh, tremendously. They, they were not. They, 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 didn't, they didn't act as though they were trying to pull each other down. No, never. Caricom would not have been in existence came into existence when it did without Forbes Burnham. You can call Forbes Burnham the father of CARICOM. CARICOM headquarters would not be in Guyana were it not for Forbes Burnham. Right, so th there's aspects, there's good and bad aspects of everybody. And we've got to look at the whole picture of a person holistically. Uh, but but my, my question, I want, I want to get please, back to this, Robert. Please, please. No, why, hold on. Why? Your question was the students at UG yes, didn't know. I said no, because with Clive there, and I know Clive. I've known Clive since the 70s. Clive is a world famous, world renowned economist. Yeah. Now, but the economists at the West Indies, who were lecturing at the university that Arthur Lewis got the funds to find, refused to teach his work. Yeah. So students there doing economics had never heard of him. One of the, one of the achievements of Sir Arthur, one of the multitude of achievements of Sir Arthur, is of course, he was the intellectual author of the Caribbean Development Bank, is it? He was a president. He was the first uh, founding president of the And he was invited to be because he had done a paper. No, not only that. People say Arthur Lewis, these economists who wouldn't teach him his work say he was um, a colonial economist. You know, you go abroad, you study something, and they tell you it's something soon as you come back. So they wouldn't teach his work, right? Arthur Lewis lost a consultancy to the British government because he told them one of their papers they put out for development to the West Indies, he said it's one of the worst papers he's ever seen that's come off an official press. They cancel his contract immediately. They forget about that. But what you said there, right? It's correct, and it's not just the intellectual author. When he came to do the Caribbean Development Bank, Princeton gave him leave for two years, no more. He hadn't set it up yet. To set up an institution like that, it, it's, it's not an easy... Try setting up a corner shop business so you know how difficult it is. To set up a Caribbean Development Bank, it's going to be woefully difficult. Princeton gave him two years' leave, and then the president... Um, Bill Bowen came down to Princeton to see Sir Arthur, and he says, um, Arthur, your know, two years is coming up. And Arthur said, well, look, Bill, we're having dinner. And he said, Bill, um, I can't leave. Um, it will take me another year. And Bill says, um, but Princeton never give more than two years' leave to anyone. And he said, well, in that case, I will have to resign. And Bill said, no, 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 you don't worry about that. We'll give you one more year. But after that year, you've got to come. <laughs> Barring so the he was willing to resign his professorship at Princeton University, which was paying him a lot more what the Caribbean Development Bank was paying him, to do, to do that for the Caribbean. The operator is signaling um, we're coming rapidly to the close. The, the three British Commonwealth Nobel laureates were all educated in the UK. The three British, you, you're talking about... No, I disagree we, we with you. We talk Walcott, we talk no, in Naipaul. No, 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 I disagree with you. Walcott went to... 
Oxford rejected Walcott because he did his mathematics. He didn't have mathematics. Ma yeah, okay. Walcott was at UWI Mona. I, I, that's where did he do his doctorate? I'm not even sure where Walcott did his doctorate. But I know when he got, I'm, I'm not even sure he has one actually. Now, do you think, do you think that there's a bias still in education between, you, you, you've spent a lot of time in the Caribbean, you know the, the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's that bias? A bias for? British education still? Oh, certainly. Definitely. But I tell you what happens. Um, Guyanese abroad are aware that the early education here, I can't say in Guyana now because I've not been here in 25 years, but when I was here, people like Emil George, Hugh George's brother, Hugh George was the general manager of um, Demar Life. Demar Life, yeah. He, would, he brought his children back that are born in America to send them to school here until they were ready for university and you find when they go here and even the graduates from UG when they go up to America they walk up summer cum laude they, they, they do excellent abroad so, so the training here I know was very good and in the West Indies it's the same with, with other West Indians this book let's, let's turn finally oh. To this book. Well, I'm really here to do the book launch, actually. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to be allowed to do commercials. Oh, Lord. No, no, no. no. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not asking to do any commercials. Hold, hold it, hold it, hold it. I'm, I was I'm trying, only joking. That's all right. Intended. Thank you. You must have a sense Thank of humor. You. No, I do have, but I'm also it's, very specific. It's 19 years ago. Um, why did you decide to relaunch this? Centennial edition. This is 100 years. Could I let it pass? Would I have been wise? Or would I have been daft to not bring it out again? It's now published for the American market and whatnot. Before it was only How published well for the Caribbean. Sold? How well has it sold? Well, this is a centennial year, and unfortunately, I've not had time. The first edition was sold out. And as a matter of fact, on the internet, you can go and buy the first edition of this book for the same price that was published 16 years ago, secondhand, for the same price this one is selling for 20 years later. That's efficiency. You're an accountant. You know what business efficiency I must have to do that. Sounds like you made all your money on the original edition. Nah, <laughs> nah Robert, I only I published 500, <laughs> man. But if you would like to order 500 and give to all your friends, <laughs> I would willingly <laughs> autograph I'm, everyone for you. <laughs> I'm, sure you I'm sure you would. I want to say thank you very much no. for appearing on Blind Dog. That's a short notice. Chris, I really do it's appreciate been it. a pleasure. I'm home. I'm having a ball, as you probably realize. And to the viewers, look, it's been a pleasure to be with you. I hope to join you again. Um, look out for the Arthur Lewis book launch because I'm going to create history with that. And perhaps in Chris or another program, we'll talk about that. But I'll create history that's never been done before anywhere in the world with that. And I'm looking forward to it. Home in my country, Guyana. Thank you. Operators and viewers, thank you. Good night. See you next week.